Good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, my name is Paul Lakeland. I direct the Center for Catholic Studies. And this afternoon we have a workshop which is the uh, one of the one of living theology workshops that we offer every semester. And this one uh, is entitled, and you have to say it carefully, how do we serve the underserved? We did unfortunately have a misprint in one of our advertisements and it came out as how do we serve the underserved, the undeserved, which is only one letter wrong. <laughs> Makes a huge difference but raises a question for us about the relationship to the underserved and the undeserved. So I'm just going to make a few remarks before I hand it over to our panelists here. To my right is Melissa Kwan, who is director of the Center for Social Impact. And to her, did I say to my left? To my right. And to her right is uh, Meredith Smith, who is the, uh, uh, who works in the, is the, works in the associate, associate dean in the Office of Residence Life. I think I got that right. Close enough. Good, close <laughs> enough, thank you. So I'm just going to introduce this and hand it over to them. And my job really is to just quickly make you think about the, the relationship between Catholic and Jesuit institutions, like and including Fairfield, and the tradition of Catholic social teaching, which really this question lies behind all three of our Living Theology sessions uh, this semester. And I'm, I find myself starting the conversation each time in the same place, which is to ask people to think about the meaning of the term, the common good. When you say that generally, people often think about uh, what's sometimes called a utilitarian notion, which is the common good is the greatest good of the greatest number. If we can get the greatest good of the greatest number, then we are serving the common good. This grows out of 18th century classical liberalism, which today has become the kind of rampant individualism, which is the bugbear of our global society. In the tradition of Catholic social teaching, this is not what the common good means. The common good means the good of the whole community measured by the degree to which it prioritizes the needs of the least fortunate members of society. So it's more about the overall health of the community and the health of the least fortunate is the place where the greatest attention needs to be paid. Now, clearly, this is going to be a particular challenge to private colleges and universities of any kind, but especially to private colleges and universities in the Catholic uh, tradition who follow the principles of Catholic social teaching, and maybe particularly the Jesuit institutions, all 27 of them. It's a challenge for two groups of people especially, which are probably not the people you see on this panel. The first people it's a challenge for is senior administration, because they have the issue, they have to struggle to balance recognizing this responsibility and exercising fiscal responsibility for the institution. And it's a difficult balance to hold. The other people for whom it's a challenge, really, is the majority of the students on this and other Catholic and Jesuit university campuses, which on the whole is not the financially or economically disadvantaged groups of people. So um, to, to the average Fairfield student or the average student of another uh, Catholic or Jesuit school, talking about shall we say, talking about affirmative action for the underserved can be understood to some extent as a kind of threat to the, to the economic viability of the school for those who don't fall into that category. The money, it's, a, it's a, you know, how you divide the pie is, is important. 
So, for Catholic schools in general, this is a difficult issue. It's in Catholic social teaching, but that's not just something popes dreamed up in the 20th century. It goes back to the Hebrew prophets. And sometimes I, I, th I wonder about a prophet like the prophet Amos back in the uh, 8th century before the Common Era in the Kingdom of Israel, going to the wealthy people of Israel and saying to them, I hate, I despise your feasts. I have no time for your solemn assemblies, but let justice flow like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, which I think translates to, let's not be too concerned about what we look like. Let's not be too concerned about our rituals, our presence of ourselves. Let's be concerned about the impact of our need to be a just institution. So I got a couple of other thoughts which I may get to later on. For now, I'm going to turn it over to the, to the panel. And I think what they're going to do is talk. I don't want to tell you what they're going to do. I'm looking forward to what they're going to do. But I think that they will talk about what should be done. And perhaps they'll also talk a little bit about how we are actually doing. Now, one little housekeeping thing before I sit down. Since this is a webinar, I'm speaking now to the uh, those of you out online, since this is a webinar, you have the opportunity to raise a question at any moment in the presentation, but you can't do it by voice. You've got to do it by typing it into the Q&A section on your screen, and I will be monitoring those questions, and I will gather the questions, and we will consider as many of them as we can at the end of our session, which will go for about an hour. So without any more ado, I turn it over to Melissa. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I'm a bit of a rule follower. Uh, <laughs> so we, we approach this discussion by tackling each of the three questions uh, that Dr. Lakeland forgot that he had posed uh, in the event description. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and those three questions are, uh, what are Catholic colleges and universities doing to shoulder their responsibilities to the prefer op preferential option for the marginalized? Uh, what are we doing at Fairfield University and what could we do better? And how can we buck the national trend towards a preferential option for the rich? So uh, we're gonna take those one by one and we're gonna do a little bit of dividing and conquering, a little bit of tag teaming um, as we move, we move along. Um, and hopefully launch us into a fruitful discussion um, where we will solve the grave and persistent inequities in U.S. Uh, Catholic higher education, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so the first question, what are Catholic colleges and universities doing? Um, so I'm just going to start with a, a little bit of framing, um, and then we'll move into some more uh, kind of practical responses to the question. Um, but in his book, Just Universities, uh, Catholic Social Teaching Confronts Corporatized Higher Education, uh, Gerald Beyer argues that because Catholic thought strongly affirms the right to education for the poor, it is important to ask whether Catholic colleges and universities have successfully provided opportunities for advanced learning for those from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, and he argues that in a knowledge-based society such as the United States, where bachelor's degree holders earn 65 to 75 percent more than high school graduates, the right to education must include higher education. Um, and he connects the right to education to the Catholic social principle of solidarity, in that to be in solidarity with the marginalized, it is the duty of Catholics to create the conditions that enable them to become full members of the community. Um, and it seems that many founders of Catholic colleges and universities agreed, at least in principle. Um, the founding missions and current stated missions of many Catholic colleges and universities express a commitment to providing access to economically disadvantaged students. Um, Fairfield University's founder, St. Ignatius of Loyola, uh, founder of the Jesuits, intended for Jesuit higher education to be inclusive of students from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, initially, it was to be free, and Jesuits were, um, quote, uh, to, to beg for the support of their works. Um, this commitment was restated by the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, Peter Hans Kolvenbach, in 1986, when he said, Jesuit schools should embody the option for the poor, both in the students that are admitted and in the type of formation that is given. 
Um, early Jesuit colleges and universities were founded in city centers, and it's common um, for us to hear or to say as we're telling the story, uh, the narrative of our institutions, that we were largely founded to serve new immigrant populations. Um, keeping tuition costs low uh, was aided uh, early on. Jesuits don't cost as much as laypersons, but of course that's uh, changing now. Um, and of course the landscape of higher education in the U.S. has changed dramatically. Um, and this includes, of course, Catholic and, and Jesuit higher education. Uh, the higher education boom that followed World War II and through the early 80s led higher education um, to, to really digging itself into a hole. Uh, Bob Dulia, and, who's vice provost, and Heather Geiger, uh, who's dire director of IT finance, both at Seattle University, wrote in an article about the challenges and changes in higher education that during this period of rapid growth, higher education was both a contributor to and a beneficiary of a rising tide. In this context, the adaptive strategy for colleges and universities was to climb the ladder. By raising tuition and enrollment, institutions could increase revenue, quality, reputation, market share, alumni, loyalty, and fundraising. And this strategy became the default for higher education, and it has been the norm for so long that institutions find it challenging to think in different ways. So we now appear to be stuck and trapped in this uh, vicious cycle that ties increased costs to increased quality, to better reputation, et cetera. So going back to Bayer, uh, again, in, in the book Just Universities, um, he, he, there's lots of statistics in here. Um, and he reports that in Catholic colleges and universities, more students from the top 1% than the bottom 60% are enrolled in elites such as Notre Dame, Georgetown, Boston College, and Villanova. 95% of U.S. colleges and universities are beyond the reach of low to moderate income students. One in nine young adults from the lowest income quartile will attain a bachelor's degree or higher compared to eight of 10 from the top income quartile. Nearly 50% of all U.S. students are Pell eligible, excuse me, Pell eligible, but are significantly underrepresented in enrolled populations. Meanwhile, uh, many schools use financial aid dollars to draw high performing and or affluent students rather than um, for students with the most need. And these realities all run counter to a mission focused on increasing access to underrepresented students, including low income, first generation, um, and students of color. So I'm going to turn it to Meredith. Great. Uh, move into Catholic social teaching and the practice. So those are some powerful numbers and powerful statistics, um, Melissa. So um, just to reframe that question, why, why would this be problematic for Catholic social teaching and for Catholic higher education? Um, there are a couple of frames of reference that we can look to. Um, in you know, Catholic higher education is an amorphous group. We're lucky that we work at a Jesuit institution whose um, mission is very clear um, in some respects. Um, and we get a lot of direction from the Jesuits through the four apostolic preferences and through their general congregations. Um, but one thing to note is that tension um, that Paul mentioned is between the fiscal responsibility of the institution and its fiscal viability and the actual what's happening on the campus. And I think that's a critical point to think about. Um, there are a couple of other things of note. It's, it's what's actually happening in our campus communities. Um, there are national trends and national narratives. Uh, there's a general decline in students being interested in, in supporting and being with others and contributing to service. It goes back to that classical liberalism, that um, rugged individualism, I'm focusing on myself. Um, other trends include seeing students and families as customers rather than students as potential future community members, uh, f future citizens of in a, a civically responsible community. Um, questions and costs of purpose around higher education. There's a lot of rhetoric out there that talks about um, is higher education worth the price? Well, for some students, it's not even attainable um, because of the cost. Um, and then just thinking through institutional cost structures, um, through some of my doctoral studies, it becomes very aware that um, a lot of our operating budget comes from room and board, which is one of the areas it's important that students are, are, are living on campus and living in this community. Um, and then one other thing to note is students' expectations. Are they expecting to become um, their in-classroom experience to be academically rigorous 
but their outside of classroom experience doesn't necessarily look at the whole person. One other thing to note is in terms of our carriers of institutional mission, um, there has been a decline in clergy on campuses and um, folks who are familiar on a deeper level of what a, working at a Catholic or Jesuit institution means doesn't mean that we're going to fully follow, you know, or, or fully be, you know, very uh, strict about what we do and how we do it, but it does mean that we're in conversation. Um, so a couple of things just to, to, to reiterate. Um, Dr. Lakeland talked about what the meaning of common good is in a higher education setting. It's not common good for the most people, it's common good for the community. And, and sometimes that, that utilitarian definition can get um, promoted and, and we lose sight of those underserved students. Another piece is looking at who the institution was designed for. Fairfield, when it was founded, was founded for immigrant communities, um, for GIs. Um, Dr. Lakeland, you might in, in inform it was designed for young men. Um, our institution clearly has, has broadened in scope and who we serve and who comes in through our, our front gates. Um, and then just another, just final note, um, how are we contributing to poverty? Some students make tremendous sacrifices to attend college. They are a loss of a revenue source for their families. And then we have other students who are incredibly resourceful. That revenue source isn't lost, but they are really having a very different educational experience. They're, um, they're coming here and hustling and getting what they need to get done, but they're not having the same collegiate experience that we're calling the Fairfield experience. Um, so I'll turn it back over to uh, Melissa to kind of give us a brighter picture of what Catholic <laughs> universities are doing well, um, and then we'll dive a little deeper in some of the things we're doing here at Fairfield. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so, so what are Catholic colleges and universities doing? Uh, so in preparation for the event, I skimmed the past uh, five or more years of Conversations Magazine, which is a biannual publication that focuses specifically on Jesuit higher education. Um, my brisk uh, research indicated that we give a lot more attention to formation of students with a commitment to serving or advocating on behalf of the marginalized and oppressed um, than we do to providing access um, to the marginalized. Um, but, you know, in Byer's book, he, he references a few practices employed by Catholic colleges and universities, and colleges and universities really broadly. Um, and they inc include things like increasing need-based aid, um, uh, employing need-blind admissions, uh, moving to test optional admissions criteria, which many, many universities um, are doing right now, um, and being intentional and strategic with recruitment um, and going, uh, recruiting from schools uh, that serve predominantly low-income students. Um, many schools, including Fairfield University, have special programs designed to increase access to underrepresented students. Um, these programs tend to provide access for small cohorts of students and often include what we refer to here as academic immersion programs, where there are intensive orientation programs um, held during the summer um, to help students prepare um, in, in, uh, for college uh, work. Um, and we'll share more uh, in more detail about what these programs look, at Fair, look like at Fairfield University. Uh, a little later. Um, and Bayer points out that a good number of smaller, uh, less, lesser resource Catholic colleges and universities admit many more low-income students than the wealthiest Catholic colleges and universities. Um, examples include LaSalle University, Loyola University of Maryland, um, Mount St. Mary's in California, um, and a small Jesuit university in Jersey City um, that some may know uh, now from Mar <laughs> March Madness. I don't know anyone in our small auditorium here. St. Peter's, of course. Go Peacocks. Go Peacocks. Yeah. Um, so a little bit about St. Peter's. Um, nearly, I, th I think, uh, about 2,300 undergrad students um, at St. Peter's, so it's small. Uh, nearly 60% of St. Peter's undergrads are Pell eligible. Um, it's among the most diverse universities in the United States. It's a, it's a Hispanic serving institution. Um, and more than 50% of undergrads are first generation college students. 
Um, and in one of those Conversations magazine articles that I looked, um, looked at, the author, uh, who's a professor of sociology at St. Peter's, attributes these statistics to the faculty and administrators' commitment to the university's mission to educate a diverse community of learners and to promote justice in our ever-changing urban and global environment. And so then I thought to look up St. Peter's and U.S. News and World Report to see how they ranked, uh, just out of curiosity, not that I place a lot of value on, on these rankings, but, um, and I compared it uh, to Fairfield University. So um, uh, Fairfield University uh, had been uh, number three and Regional Universities North, um, and St. Peter's is number 58. Um, Fairfield U is number three in Best Undergraduate Teaching, and St. Peter's is number 24. Um, Fairfield is number 19 in best value. St. Peter's is number seven. Um, and, but this is, the, this is the interesting one for me that kind of jumped out. Um, in terms of uh, top performers on social mobility, uh, Fairfield University ranked 155 and St. Peter's ranked number 11. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously there's, there's a give and take there's a, um, in, in, in all of this. Um, and the other thing that, that colleges and universities do and that um, actually falls into my area of work uh, is in community engagement. And we often have uh, robust campus community partnerships that are aimed towards improving educational outcomes for young people in the communities that surround um, our institutions and in some case um, might even serve as, as pipelines um, to the institution. So these range in development um, and purpose, everything from, from tutoring programs that we were all probably familiar with, uh, to more extensive partnerships that can, as I said, create a pipeline uh, from the community to the campus, um, all those, although those are, are rare. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk yeah. about universal divine or move, move on? I think we can move on a little bit. Okay. So um, more about what we're specifically doing here at Fairfield. Um, our colleagues in the enrollment area have a number of different scholarships for some of these community partnerships, um, including uh, tuition for local communities, uh, the Bridgeport Scholarship, um, and the, the Community Partner Scholarship. Those scholarships are great opportunities. Those students tend to commute because, um, and we all know gas costs a lot these days, um, but because it doesn't include room and board on some of those, those programs. Uh, we have an incredible partnership with Upper Bound, um, and we're seeking new ideas. Our, our proposed Bellarmine College, modeled after the Rupe College at um, Loyola University to increase access. Um, additionally, for our students who are currently on campus, uh, we have a pre-college arrival program called Academic Immersion, which serves about 30 students um, who their high school experience may have had um, a, a set of standards that hasn't prepared those students properly for college level work. Um, we also have mentoring programs, the Cure Personalis Mentoring Program for underserved students. Um, and then one final note um, around what we're doing well, I will say as a campus community, when we are aware of a student in crisis, um, we do have incredibly caring team members who will figure out a way to make sure that student um, has access to what they need. Um, but sometimes there are students who are just on the cusp of the crisis and they're not able to communicate that need. Um, so, you know, that speaks to we could cover um, what we could do better and some things to think about. We are not a need blind institution um, because we financially can't be at this point. But what does that mean? So we have students who we do, who are able to access, get full scholarships, but they and their families may be one crisis away from needing to drop out of schools. I mentioned this before, that loss of revenue. Um, many of our students have off-campus jobs and balance a lot, um, so they're not able to experience um, the community or the sense of belonging that other students have. Um, as an institution, we can make a stronger commitment to representation um, in ensuring that our campus community is able to support these students. Um, it's not just tuition, it's books. It's, uh, I know there's a student who um, their calculator broke the day before an exam and that's a $150 piece of, of, of equipment that they, they, that they need. So it's just thinking through what are some of these ways what are these structures and systems that we have in place that are, are barriers to our students' success and achievement? Um, 
I think, and we're, we're on the way there, uh, is looking at improved visibility and support of our commuter students. We have almost 400 commuter students, undergrads, full time on this campus and ensuring that this campus is a place where they are visible, valued, and welcomed. Um, we just recently opened a new commuter study collaboration space in the, the Burrone Campus Center. Um, again, doesn't go far enough, but it's, it's a start. Um, and then there's a lot of our, our commuter students who are also in STEM and nursing, very science heavy majors. It's thinking through how do we support these students as they're also supporting their families. Um, so those are just a couple of notes of things that we can improve upon. I, there's also a lot of conversation over the word rigor on the national scale um, and how that word can sometimes be misconstrued and really um, not help our students put their best foot forward. We, we let them know, oh, you're, you're not academically prepared. What does that set a student up for? It doesn't set them up for success. Um, when most of these students are very resilient um, and very prepared. Um, just another quick note, our, the student experience looks different um, or is perceived, there are perceived differences for students of different identities. Yes, we're a Catholic institution, um, but how do we look at other holidays? Um, do we have halal or kosher meat options in, in our dining facilities? Do we um, support students as they're celebrating their various faith traditions? They may not be the Catholic tradition. Um, it's also awareness and appropriation of other traditions um, in terms of some of the out of classroom weekend behavior, it's uh, appropriation of traditions that are not students own. Um, I know we always put additional staff on for Cinco de Mayo because students are celebrating it even though they have no idea what the origin of that holiday is and what the meaning of that holiday is. Um, so I think that's just important to note. Um, and then just lastly, like we do have um, crisis resources and emergency resources, um, but they're not necessarily visible, if that makes sense. So we support students who are housing or food insecure. Um, we find workable solutions for financial contingencies, but these are things students wouldn't necessarily know. Um, and then access for first-gen students who may become from a home that English is not their first language. Do we have translation services available? So I think those are just some things that we can think about and potentially do better as we, we move forward and as we think about how we serve the underserved. I'll turn it back to Melissa to talk about that preferential option for the rich. <laughs> <laughs> so the final question. Um, how can we buck the national trend uh, towards a prefer preferential option for the rich? Um, so 10 or so years ago, might have been more, uh, Dr. Lincoln <laughs> probably knows uh, more uh, exactly, but yeah. Fairfield University, the former Fairfield University president, Father Jeffrey Von Arx, um, advocated that the then 28 U.S. Jesuit colleges and universities band together um, to make a commitment to, to need-based aid. Um, he advocated that the 28 make a commitment to not stoke competition, um, at least among the, the 28 U.S. Jesuit colleges and universities, by shifting financial aid from need uh, to merit um, in order to compete for students. And unfortunately, he was not successful, and I think Meredith um, alluded to this in her, in her comments, and we're, so we're now kind of in a situation where uh, we can't be need, need blind. Um, but is this something we could revisit? Um, the ability to act in solidarity uh, as a unified front is a power that Jesuit colleges um, hold as, as a consortium, um, you know, one of the, the few uh, consortiums within U.S. higher education. Um, and the other one thing I want to talk a little bit about here, um, it's not really uh, a solution, unfortunately, bring, not bringing a ton of solutions to the table here today, <laughs> um, is, the, is something um, that I, I am, uh, was introduced to recently, um, and it's a concept coined uh, by scholar Gloria Latson billings um, and it's the concept of the education debt, um, which really refers to the cumulative effect of educational marginalization. Uh, she draws on an analogy with the national financial debt, um, comparing it, making it a distinction between uh, the national debt versus the national deficit. So the national deficit is based on short-term outlook. You could have a year when the national budget is balanced and there's no deficit. 
However, at the same time um, that you have no deficit, the national debt continues to grow exponentially because of the cumulative effect of deficits in past years. Um, so Lats and Billings off, um, offers this, this concept as a contrast, um, or, or really a metaphor for the achievement gap, uh, which is, we hear this all the time, right? It's the achievement gap that we're, we're aiming to address. Um, but the achievement gap is also a snapshot. Um, it places the emphasis on individual student achievement uh, and not systemic problems. Um, and the interventions then that we develop to address the achievement gap tend to focus on, on programs um, that, uh, while important and beneficial, tend to help uh, a small number in proportion to the, the full um, scope of the need. Um, so it focuses on programs and curricular interventions. Um, and these, unfortunately, uh, fail to address the cumulative debt that has built up over hundreds of years of educational marginalization. So even the greatest access and affordability programs, um, you know, largely address the symptoms. Um, they serve a proportionately small number of students. They target deficits in students um, and individuals opposed as inequities in the system. And they don't fundamentally change the way that we do business. Um, which Ladson Billings argues is necessary to address the education debt. Um, so she writes uh, in this paper, um, imagine that an examination of the achievement performance of children of color provoked an immediate reassignment of the nation's best teachers to the school serving the most needy students. Imagine those same students were guaranteed places in state and regional colleges and universities. Imagine that within one generation, we lift those students out of poverty. Um, and so I guess I offer a launching off question mm -hmm. then, since we didn't answer it. Mm -hmm. um, so how would we want to imagine or reimagine Catholic higher education, um, possibly uh, using this metaphor that Ladson Billings offers us? <laughs> That's our question for you, Paul. Unpack. They're both looking at me, so, uh, you know, it's funny you should put the put it that way. It goes back to something that uh, that we were Colin was talking about earlier, and that is uh, that um, the origins of Fairfield are very much were exactly this. That when Fairfield's first undergraduates arrived at the university uh, almost seventy five years ago now in nineteen forty seven, September nineteen forty seven. This was a freshman class. They were more, slightly more than two thirds of them were first generation students uh, from Bridgeport, New Haven, Waterbury, the sort of places you would imagine, um, coming to a university uh, with a very low uh, tuition charge. And uh, the other bunch were GI veterans on a GI Bill. But these students, their parents were um, mostly people who worked in you know, construction work or uh, not professionals at all. People who you know, were probably, many of them functionally illiterate, and they scraped together enough money to pay that very small tuition to get their kids into the school. There was no room and board in those days. There was nowhere to stay. Five or six students from Waterbury came to school every day for the whole year, the first year, driven by a faculty member who decided he was going to drive them backwards and forwards. And that, if that was the only reason, that would be a good reason for Carmen Donnarumma's name to be on one of the buildings on the campus, because mm -hmm. it was an extraordinary thing to do. Mm -hmm. But here's the interesting thing. These students graduated in 1951, and two-thirds of them went into medical school or law school or one of the other professions. And the other third did one thing or another, but it was an extraordinary move in upward mobility, social mobility. I mean, whether they earned more money or not didn't matter so much, but educationally and professionally, uh, they were extra there was an extraordinary development. And this was due to these, these founding Jesuits and a few faculty. And 
So that makes you think, obviously it's a different place now. We, we're not going to do that again, but it does make you wonder what, what is the potential impact upon the students that, that we're talking about if we were able to, to have them, uh, to, to, to find them and to finance their education appropriately. Um, there's one question here that I think is a pretty good question uh, that sort of looks sideways at what we're saying, but it's useful. So largely what we're talking about here is what we ought to do if we could about addressing this problem. But the question I have here is, well, can we look at this pragmatically for a minute? If we could attract and we could make it financially possible for a much larger number of people, less advantaged, less socially advantaged people to attend Fairfield University, would that change the school for the better or the worse? What would it do? What would it do to the school? I have a thought, yeah. but maybe you do. I have do. a thought too, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, I'm a little biased, not to use that word, but I know um, from research we know students who are in environments that are more representative of a global community, of a diverse community, um, everybody benefits in that community. Um, that said, uh, there's some key lines that we need to be mindful of in terms of we don't want to tokenize our students who are from uh, these experiences. We don't want to rely on these students to educate us who potentially are in the majority um, about their experience. And I think, um, but I know, um, at least speaking from my own experience, going to an undergraduate institution that was more religiously diverse, it was all women, so it wasn't, it wasn't gender diverse, but it was, it was religiously diverse culturally diverse, um, you know, students from different opinions, backgrounds, everything. Um, it, it disrupted who I was as a person and thus helped me grow. And I think that's also part of what we, we need to disrupt a little bit in terms of going to college is not going to, it shouldn't be easy um, from an intellectual standpoint, but it it should challenge us and help us grow. And I think that's part of, we should constantly be in conversation. The early Jesuits were always in conversation with people um, in places that were different. And I think it would be going back to our roots a little bit if we, if we were able to do this. Um, I agree with that, and I, I think I would, I would say, though, that um, if that were the case, we would be required to change. We would have to. Um, and I know Bayer makes the point in the book that even if tuition were, were, were zero, um, students would still face struggles mm -hmm. um, in our community as it is. And I was uh, reading recently, someone shared with me a reflection um, written by a, a teacher um, a Jesuit at uh, Loyola Chicago who works as part of a Rube College and so um, you know Rube College is similar to or it's it's the you know the the Bellarmine College that we're looking to create here um, is modeled on the Rube College concept and the, his reflection was about a conversation that he was having with with one of the Rube students um, and he he asked the student um, well when you graduate from a Rube College are you going to come to Loyola and the student kind of looked at him and, and la kind of laughed and said, no, mm -hmm. I, I don't belong there. Um, and, and so I think we need to really, um, we, we need to think about that because we need to make it, um, we need to become an institution where, where student, students belong and feel that they can belong. Um, so it's a both and. We would be changed, of course, but we would be required to change in order for that to happen. You know, I'd, I'd add one element to this. Uh, I've, over the years, often bored people by talking about how we're, the university educates, obviously in the classroom, 
but to some degree, maybe even more, by what we teach students by the way we live and express ourselves. And you know, I, I've summarized that sometimes by saying, you know, I think the purpose of our, our educational purpose overall is to model for students the kind of society that we hope they will contribute to creating in the years beyond uh, graduating. And one of the things that, we, that is so evident in our American society today is that we, are, we all live in silos, mm -hmm. right? Now, you can you know, pick on the immensely rich who live behind ga in gated communities, but that, that's just the extreme example. We tend to associate with the people we agree with, live with people of a similar, live in neighborhoods of people with a similar uh, lifestyles and so on. Um, and the structure of American education now with the very elite colleges and places like ours and state institutions and community colleges and so on sort of replicates that. Mm -hmm. So if we were able to do uh, something to, to significantly increase the number of underserved students on the campus so that we weren't making them into tokens, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't just be, con we'd, we'd be doing what we're supposed to do, but we'd also be doing something to ameliorate this very corrosive uh, siloage, siloage, is that the word? Mm -hmm. Siloing of, uh, <laughs> silage is something different siloing of American society. So I think it, it, it's, it's good for the individual students, it's good for this community, it's good for the mission of Jesuit institutions, and it's actually good for, it would actually be good for American society right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was another question here, which I, I, I think it's, it's a background question to what we've been talking about, but it, I don't know how easily we answer it. And that is, a lot of what we're, we're saying here goes against the grain of uh, fiscal pragmatism. Mm -hmm. What would it cost us to be a sign of contradiction? That's another question from the ether. Mm. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Anyone want to take a stab at that? The call finance. <laughs> uh, that's such a tricky. Oh, friend. <laughs> that's such a tricky um, question. Um, a university's budget should be a reflection of their mission, one's mission and action. Um, but the other piece is universities are very complex structures. We are complex, and and there's a cost associated. We are a relatively young institution at, you know, uh, oh shoot, I should know, well, 75 years since we welcomed the first <laughs> incoming class. Um, but at the same time, things cost money. Um, I have to say, you know, kudos to our, our colleagues in facilities. They make sure we don't have a lot of deferred maintenance, um, where some of our, our colleagues at other institutions, um, I won't name names, <clears throat> up in New Haven, but um, have a lot more stonework and things that cost. And you don't mean Albertus Magnus. No, do I don't mean Albertus <laughs> Magnus. But like pieces, deferred maintenance that cost a great deal of money that can, um, not that that institution will ever be in a, in a crisis point, but um, I think that's, there's the very real cost of attending college. What students are paying in the overall cost are two different things. The tuition does not cover fully, believe it or not, even though tuition is very high, the cost of attending. Um, so, and that's due to really, you know, wonderful fiscal planning on, on Fairfield's part. So that's such a tricky, it's a tricky proposition um, to think about. But one thing is, you know, we look at investing in our students now with the hope that they will give back later, as opposed to um, seeking out those who will give us money now, but 
it's not sustainable for the future. So I think we have to think about pain now or pain later, um, just in general. So I'll stop talking. Those are my thoughts. Yeah. It's a hard, a difficult, difficult question. Why? Yeah. Which I is know. why it's really hard for for senior leadership. I was going to ignore like the question, but I didn't. Sit here yeah. and uh, you know, be critics. But um, I think it's also. Um, I, I mean, I've been thinking about this for a while now, but uh, it's also not just about financial costs, but other costs, um, because I don't, I don't really under see how our current and and I don't, I'm not saying Fairfield University General Higher Education in the mm -hmm. United States, how our measures of of prestige um, and and quality do not um, go hand in hand with. Um, a mission to, to serve the underserved, not with the way that our, not with the inequities that exist within education in the U.S. in general. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the you know measures of, um, you know, the the SAT scores of, of incoming students or the GPA or all of these things just don't jive um, with the inequities mm -hmm. that exist within K through 12. Um, and so I think. That, that whole thing needs to be bucked as well, and there has to be some sacrifices, um, or willingness to make some sacrifices there too, um, I think. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine too. Uh, I mean, I think the question is not just about financial mm -mm. issues, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the question might be looking for an answer that says, well, there might be some advantages mm -hmm. to doing this. Mm -hmm. Maybe even some marketing advantages mm -hmm. to doing this. Mm -hmm. But that will be a difficult issue too. How do you market um, your commitment to serving the underserved without getting a kind of not in my backyard response from, from uh, those we traditionally serve. It's a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. It is, it is. Um, and yeah, just to think through, I hate to use that marketplace. It's a noisy, you know, our, our students, including underserved students, they have a lot of options to choose from. And part of it is because we're not potentially marketing to those students, they're choosing other institutions and thus making those institutions better places. Um, for some students, I, you know, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that question. I, I think we, we can lean in a little bit more on our, our Jesuit Catholic history um, and be okay with it and be okay with the tension. Um, I, I know I love, I love our families and I've, I've had conversations with parents uh, and students. It's typically our students are cool with with the differences, and it's it's sometimes the families that are not as understanding. It's you know, and I, I like to look at things from a positive intent. I think everybody means well, but a meaning well and acting well are two very different things sometimes. Yeah, I do have a a sort of it comes back to a mm -hmm. point that Melissa made that uh, there was a time ten years or so ago when the former president tried to do something about this, and I'm not really want to focus on the challenge here, which obviously turned out to be difficult. And I think that year we had our lowest enrollment for many years. But the fact that the, the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities would not get together and decide to, let's get on the same page here. All right, let's set a modest total to begin with, but let's commit to it. That's, I think, extremely disappointing. I know, I know that uh, Jeff was disappointed. Anyway, I have another question here. So uh, this is a question from uh, uh, Barry Ryan, who uh, I want to say before I read this question, and Barry will laugh. Uh, he is a good friend of Fairfield University. Yay, thanks, Barry. But here's the question. There are two Catholic universities in the Fairfield area, Fairfield and Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. Just walking around the campuses, Fairfield seems so white, Sacred Heart so diverse. Is its admission standards? Is it admission standards that counts for this, or is it a commitment to Catholic social teaching? We should probably ask the people at Sacred Heart about that. <laughs> but you, do you want to? Does, any, does anything come to mind here? No, I don't. I don't. I don't really want to make.
take a guess on that, really. I don't, uh, you know, <laughs> this, I shouldn't say this, but, you know, Sacred Heart, in terms of its proximity to our, our wonderful neighbors in Bridgeport, um, it's, you know, I, I, it goes back to potentially marketing as well. Um, you know, not to knock, our, we do have a beach culture. We it, release students to the beach um, and families do make incredible sacrifices so students can live at the beach their senior year. But that feeds into more of this vacation culture as opposed to higher education culture. Not knocking the beach, we will not be getting rid of the beach. I know that room is always out there, but, um, but I think we have to look at the both it can be a both and, it's not an either or proposition. Um, so, but that's interesting. We should call our colleagues at Sacred Heart. I'm gonna go um, look up their statistics yes. later tonight. Yes. I, I, I do think, you know, so I, I run our Center for Catholic Studies and I, I do, th my perception is that Sacred Heart handles the rhetoric of the Catholic intellectual tradition better than we do. That's to say, they're more of their leadership, even more of their faculty, seem to be on that page. So the perception, uh, I think Barry's perception is understandable. I don't know about the, the question of whether it's more white or more diverse. I don't spend enough time on their mm -hmm. campus to know if that's the case. But I think he is right that they do they do they do a lot of things connected to the Catholic intellectual tradition that um, I wouldn't say they put us to shame, but they they teach us a bit. So that's the best we could do with that. Um, do we have another question here? Hold on. No, we have no more questions there. So do we have a question from the house? Uh, the, the many people in the auditorium seem not to have a question. Um, I'm just looking at one more thing here. Just can I pop in real quick? Yeah. One thing to note, because we've talked a lot about cost, um, I, I think higher ed is going to hit a point where increased costs yearly is just unsustainable. So. Um, know that that's potentially coming. What does that look like for Fairfield? I'm not sure, but um, just we, we will see these trends where, you know, uh, I know uh, colleagues at another Jesuit institution, their price tag is $80,000 a year for attendance. And I'm just like, whoa, that's, who can afford that? Mm -hmm. hmm. Who should afford that? Right. So, but that's also, you know, other factors too. Does either of you have a last word for our audience? I, g I gave these two people a very difficult task, <laughs> and they've, they've, they've done a remarkably good job here because uh, it is just every, everybody would like to be able to wave a magic wand and, and make our campus more diverse in every respect, including, and maybe even primarily, uh, serving the underserved. There's no question, I think, I mean, there may be a few hermits in a cave somewhere on campus who don't agree with that, but I think people do agree with that. But it's such a difficult thing to do for all the reasons they've laid out. But we have to keep trying because our mission demands that we, we, we attend to this. We, 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 we can never let ourselves sit back and be comfortable and say, well, we did the best we could, we'll just go ahead. And uh, those are my last words. Anyone else? You know, I just, to build off that a little bit, um, we end the exam in prayer in hope, um, but hope takes work. So I, I just want to echo, we can't give up in terms of um, when we see injustice in front of us, addressing it, but also thinking, be forward thinking as an institution um, and just if we get lost in the it's either or we're in trouble so we have to 
think about both and or other like you know I love how you step sideways on some of these questions like maybe we have to step out of our box of thinking um, and be creative and examine and imagine um, you know what the future will hold we know this past year and a half two years or two years of the pandemic um, was really a huge disruptor in higher education we've made it through um, but what if anything what lessons from this these past two years can we take forward and how we were able to reimagine um, and, and ensure that the students that we are serving are served well so just a couple of thoughts there yeah. um, I mean I like ending with the concept of, of hope. And, um, you know, I think we have um, some resources and programs in place that are um, probably underutilized. And so we should all learn about them and um, do what we can to bring our support behind them. Um, there's a lot of new things coming through admissions, um, the Company Scholars Program. Um, we have the Bridgeport Tuition Program, um, which I think um, could be utilized more. Um, and, you know, the conversations that we've been having on campus this year around access and affordability, um, while they have been um, difficult, they've, they're important. Um, and it's not, it's not easy work um, to work through these things. And so um, I'm, I'm grateful um, for the conversations that we've been having um, this year um, and look forward to them continuing because it is the hard work that is the good work, I think. Okay, well, uh, just before I close with a little thank you here, uh, two weeks from today, in this same place, at this same time, we'll have the third and last of our Living Theology sessions for this uh, semester, and our topic will be racial justice and the call for reparations. So uh, we look forward to seeing some of you, all of you, more of you here uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, finally, my thanks to Meredith and Melissa for a very good conversation. Thank you all for being here. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.